Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to firstly thank the organisers for inviting me to give uh, a talk which really encompasses two talks on subjects that are very close to my heart, i.e. the role of primary trabeculectomy and the role of primary tube implantation and glaucoma. I work with a number of companies as well and here are my financial disclosures. Trabeculectomy efficacy is fairly well undisputed. It's still the most effective IOP lowering procedure in our portfolio. With appropriate case selection, trabeculectomies will lower IOP more and for much longer than the alternatives. And this has been known for a very long time, back to the days of the Morfield Primary Treatment Trial, the collaborative initial glaucoma treatment study, and subsequently. The European Glaucoma Society in its uh, earlier guidelines encapsulated the, the differences in medical therapy efficacy uh, across a number of studies, including the collaborative initial glaucoma study medical treatment arm, but they, they did not include any surgical treatment studies at the time. And you will see that it's quite obvious that surgical treatment is more effective, and this is trabeculectomy. The problem with trabeculectomy, apart from the unpredictability and relative crudeness of the procedure, is that case selection is absolutely critical. This is a 20 year follow up study uh, that's quite well known um, from Cambridge, the, the home of trabeculectomy, and uh, the fantastic results at 20 years in patients who generally had very early trabeculectomy surgery 60% uh, with no topical, topical meds and 90% uh, controlled with, with the additional topical medication. However, there is quite a significant variation in efficacy depending on glaucoma diagnosis, patient age, and uh, previous surgery. So it's not all that straightforward, and case selection is absolutely critical. We're all also very much aware that you can apply uh, the same amount of mitomycin to four different patients and get very different blebs and four very different results. Here's a more recent randomized clinical trial. The FDA pivotal study of the uh, in-focus of microshunt. The one year results uh, of this randomized clinical trial of TRAB versus Preserflow in uh, low risk cases showed that the Preserflow reduced the pressure from 21 to 14 after one year, which is very reasonable. But TRABs reduced the pressure from 21 to 11, which obviously in more advanced glaucoma is more desirable. So trabeculectomy efficacy is very good, but case selection is absolutely critical. Postoperative management we know can be laborious and unpredictable. And trabeculectomy really is best suited to practices who do a lot, uh, like, like any type of procedure really. Whether you believe in trabeculectomy or not depends fundamentally on what you believe we should be doing for patients with advanced glaucoma patients like this. No matter what you believe about target pressure, some patients have a high risk of severe visual loss from progression. And there's a historical reality check here. The advanced glaucoma intervention study 22, 23 years ago showed that eyes with advanced damage had no progression in eight years of follow-up if the pressures were consistently less than 18. It's sometimes therefore quoted that you could aim for 17 and be okay. But the average of those consistently below 18 was actually 12. And at 12 millimeters mercury, the risk of a three decibel loss at eight years was 13%. In mid-teens, the risk was about 30%. And at 20, the risk was about 70%. So whether you or not you believe in the term target IOP, there seems to be a continuous reduction in risk of progression as you lower the IOP. However, for years, proponents of less invasive procedures have argued that a low target pressure isn't, is not required. And some of the basis of this claim has been on the, on the results of the advanced glaucoma intervention study. Um, and they say that any IOP was less than 18 was enough to prevent progression, but this is fundamentally wrong. The advanced glaucoma intervention study did not show that. So what is the target IOP when a field is like this? Well, we really don't know, but what we do know is that any progression at all will be bad news. So therefore, you have to aim for maximum IOP lowering, which is why the TRAB still has a raison d'etre. That's probably also true of patients with advanced or paracentral field defects who are also high risk of central visual field loss.
So the role of primary trabeculectomy is in patients at a high risk of visual loss who do not have other failure risk factors, uh, such as eyes that look like beetroots from medication. Tubes uh, work to some degree in almost anyone, except, interestingly, for the low risk primary cases where trabs ironically work well. And it also depends on which tube you use. And these two points are critical. Everyone by now is probably aware of the differences between the AMID valve and the Barvelt implant. They've both been around for more than 25 years. The Barvelt roughly 28 years. Unlike the AMID valve, the Barvelt, as with all non-valved implants, is quite hard work. And if you simply ligate it in the traditional way, you have a risk of very high pressures afterwards or very low pressures if you don't get it right. Augmenting uh, the uh, technique with uh, an internal occluding suture seems to iron out these uh, problems to some degree. So instead of using a an all or none ligature, a stent up the middle of the tube into the anterior chamber, either squeezed tightly at the entry site or by itself, or augmented with ligatures that can either um, absorb or be lasered later, does offer a, de a, a degree of uh, control that you can't get with the all or none uh, ligation technique. But on the other hand, requires more post-operative care and more post-operative uh, manipulation. But also offers you more options. There have been two simultaneous randomized clinical trials of the Barveld implant, the 101350 specifically, and the AMID valve, the FP7. Both have shown pretty much the same thing. Barvelt gets better IOP control, AMID has a better safety profile. The AMID is more forgiving if you're not familiar with the technique than the Barvelt is. And like everything with a Barvelt, you need higher volume. When you pull these two studies, you have 514 patients on, in total, 267 AMIDs, 247 Barvelts. And you can see that at five years, there's over 170 in each group. And the pooled results um, show not unexpectedly um, a significant difference between the AMID and the Barvel in terms of pressure control and in terms of medication. This was actually not just statistically significant, but quite clinically significant, because at five years uh, with the AMID, you're getting pressures of around 16 and a half on two medications. With Barvel, you're getting pressures of around 13 on 1.5 medications. So really is quite a difference between the two in terms of efficacy. Tubes, unlike trabeculectomy, work in almost anyone, except the low-risk primary cases, but this relates specifically to the Barvelt 101350. Why do I say they don't work in primary cases? The primary tube versus trabeculectomy study investigated this. Eligibility, uncontrolled glaucoma, no previous surgery, i.e. everyone is phakic. At 29 investigators at 16 clinical centres, the three UK centres, I must point out, provided 40% of the total enrollment. The 256 randomized, uh, resulting at three years, which has now been published uh, 103 in one group and 97 in the other. And at three years, um, similar to one year, so the starting pressures were around 23, 24, which is lower than they would be with most tube studies because this was a primary uh, glaucoma surgical study. And at three years, uh, Despite having slightly lower starting pressures, the tube group had slightly higher finishing pressures, 14 on two meds versus 12 on 1.2 meds for the TRAB group. And this was a significant difference. It's still significant that the tube group did achieve 14, but it's requiring two meds. The probability of failure at, at different pressure levels, um, a pressure greater than 17 or less than 20% drop uh, was significantly different in the, uh, between the two groups. Interestingly, when you went for lower target pressures, there wasn't much difference. So in fact, if you want pressure of uh, around 15, 14, 15, you get a very high level with a tube group as well. Overall, the tubes are doing less well in primary cases than the TRABs. And the five-year outcomes have actually been submitted for presentation at the AAO in New Orleans. So watch this space.
So trials versus tubes, with appropriate case selection, trials will lower IOP for more and for much longer than the alternatives. Whereas the bar belt works to some degree in almost anyone. So when are primary tubes indicated? Well, usually not in primary open angle glaucoma with no other failure risk factors at, for the reasons I've just alluded to. Unless, of course, follow-up can be challenging. Patient lives a long way away, can't uh, come for frequent visits after TRAB. Uh, Post-operative ma manipulation likely to be impossible. Tubes let require less manipulation than TRABs. More importantly, though, most secondary glaucomas and other primary situations where TRAB has no hope of success. And uh, there are many such uh, situations that you'll be familiar with. Of course, scleral buckles are becoming less frequent these days, but eyes with uh, previous retinal attachment surgery do poorly with trabeculectomy for obvious reasons, uh, whereas tubes function um, pretty much as well in these as they do in anything else. Conjunctival scarring doesn't seem to impair tube function, whereas it uh, devastates TRAB prospects. Now, this is uh, one example is uh, pemphigoid, but there are many others. Now, obviously, with pemphigoid, the biggest concern is ensuring that the disease is well controlled prior to implanting the tube. And uh, as I mentioned, after retinal surgery, I would not, in general, tube someone with an oil fill. But after oil has been removed, a tube is uh, probably the best option in many cases. What about cases where you couldn't even do a diode? This pace, patient had uh, very thin sclera. It's clearly not suitable for diode. But uh, in, even in these situations, it is logistically possible with, a certain, uh, with certain technique modifications to implant a tube. You've got to obviously choose your quadrant carefully, find the bit where there's the most sclera, and you can reinforce the underlying sclera uh, with pericardium or, or donor sclera or fascia lata, and then you can put another layer on top. And uh, in all these situations, there's, there's usually a way you can put in a tube safely. What about eyes where there's a very high risk of hypotony from CPC? Well, you can, you do have some control over the pressure postoperatively with the tube. Chemical burns are especially at risk of uh, severe hypotony following CPC. And you can always implant a tube uh, if you can find uh, adequate tissue. And there are those cases where you really must avoid hypotony at all costs. These include, obviously, Sturt Weber syndrome. Ignore the AV malformations, if they, even if these bleed externally, they're slow bleeders, it doesn't actually matter much. But if you get hypotony, the eye could be in serious trouble. So it's technically possible to implant a tube successfully in all sorts of situations with various impediments. Where external filtration would not have much hope of success. But do they actually work in such cases? The evidence suggests that they actually do work in these difficult situations. And the study that originally got me interested in the bar valve was this one from Doheny in the early 90s that showed in patients with uh, somewhat uh, complex glaucomas with high failure uh, risks, um, the bar valve achieved pressure levels of uh, 13 on average on one medication after five years. Uh, with a cumulative success of roughly 79%, and that's the 350 bar belt in this uh, randomized trial. And here's a, a typical example, the first uh, bar belt over buckle uh, patient that I did and showed earlier, a few months after surgery. This patient has stickler syndrome, pressure at high single figures, decent bleb over the tube. 13 years later, still the same, patient still doing well and still coming to the clinic. But of course, it's not that simple. Nothing ever is. Bar valve flow control requires much more experience and a higher volume practice than implanting an almond valve. I like to look at the actual amount of flow coming out of the tube, and this one's got a little bit too much, so I would add a ligature here. On the other hand, this super mid is like a cork. I keep pulling it back and pulling it back, and there's absolutely zero flow, so there will be high pressure afterwards. Mitigate some of this with a 3O ethylon, which, like the super mid, is 3O nylon. It does seem to be much looser and requires more ligatures. I like to ligate with 10 nylon and lay them one by one uh, to produce a stepwise reduction where possible. Tubes have other issues, corneal endothelial cell loss, exposure, diplopia. This is a prospective study performed uh, in my clinic by Scott Howe, looking at endothelial cell loss in relation to bar valve implant position in the angle. 
and uh, these are the results if the tube entry site was completely behind Swalby's line after five years you lose just under 25 percent of endothelial cells but as it crosses Schwalbe's line it goes up to almost 50 percent loss at five years if it's interesting if it's right in the cornea there's slightly less loss than there was anterior to Schwalbe's line but uh, th th these are the, the respective graphs so tube entry site in the angle away from Schwalbe's line uh, gives you about half the endothelial cell loss than tube entry site around Schwalbe's line so the tube tip should never be against the cornea but the tube entry site shouldn't be either and you can always sulcus fixate the tube behind a, an existing iridectomy as in here or make your own iridectomy exposure it's important to get the plate as far from the limbus as possible plate exposure is a nightmare when it occurs Avoid implants with pars plana modifications. They have a much higher erosion rate. I currently use fascia lata, which is uh, easily available off the shelf and doesn't require um, lazing with an eye bank. It, it's thicker and harder wearing than pericardium. Diplopia is unpredictable. But uh, this was the primary tube versus trabeculectomy as results, which interestingly show slightly less diplopia than in the more uh, studies involving more complex patients. And it may be that multiple surg surgical procedures in the past increase the risk of diplopia, which seems logical. One advance is the pole glaucoma implant, uh, and I should declare a financial interest in, in that I uh, co-designed it. Uh, which has a smaller tube than either the almond or barvelt, considerably smaller, and then theoretically uh, should be uh, kinder to endothelium and less likely to expose. It can be occluded with 6O proline. And again, using this little well, you can actually observe the flow. And sometimes you need to ligate it as well. And occasionally the 6O proline is too tight and you use 7O. But in general, a 6O proline by itself is enough. And you can see the well filling up. In summary, Trabeculectomies are unpredictable and case selection is absolutely critical. But in low failure risk cases, although the average pressure with the TRAB is around 11 or 12, they still provide the only chance of getting single dig digit IOP control when you need it. With tubes, however, the most effective implant is the hardest to get right. But the Barvelt does provide broad efficacy in a wide range of high failure risk cases. The pole glaucoma implant is a smaller tube and is likely to have lower long-term morbidity than the barvelt, but this remains to be proven. Thank you very much for your attention and for the kind invitation.